we had this fitness founder on earlier today. And I think that like even just talking to him for an hour, it was really clear that the product that he kind of brought to market was really authentic to challenges that he was facing in his life and a problem that he didn't see being solved. If you had to give somebody advice who was like, I want to start a podcast or I want to start a company, what advice would you give to that person to make sure that whatever they're creating is authentic to them? So Moe's, what's going on? We just had a great podcast in the morning, but uh, you, you fucked it up. <laughs> I fucked it up, really. How, how did I do that? You know, you just didn't do the audio right. Something like that. I don't know. Oh. It's just what I read online. <laughs> it's what really? Because I'm not the audio guy. <laughs> yeah, so we had a great podcast. We'll have to redo. Hopefully put it out next week with uh, Dom Modeste. He's the founder of Gladiator, recovery brand. He came over and uh, I messed up the audio. I couldn't find a certain chord, so we bootstrapped together some and scraped it together, and uh, it didn't work out. The audio was terrible, and we're gonna have to redo it. So that's where we're at. <laughs> that's why we're here. That's completely all my fault. Hi. And that sucks. I hate wasting his time, but we're here. <laughs> you know what? All good. All good. Um, yeah. So, what's going on, man? Like, what have you been up to? What's what's going on work wise? I think you were telling me about the pitch Work project wise. with our friend. Yeah, so I, I love this. I get, we were talking about something off camera the other day. And it's always funny going back home to Thunder Bay sometimes because people will be like, so what do you do? And I never have a good answer. I hate the question, but like I love that they're asking. Um, but right now, I'm working with a guy who's trying to make a video game. Um, and what people often don't realize, like video games are so fun to play, but what the casual average person wouldn't understand is that you need a small army of people to like make that happen and a lot of money. So I am helping this guy, um, work out his pitch that he's going to give it to investors, um, and the deck that goes along with it. So that's taking up a lot of my time. What are you doing these days? Well, before I talk, I mean like what like what's a pitch deck and what's all that look like because i feel like that's an interesting it's an interesting space that i think a lot of creatives actually could do a good job at who understand right. you know, marketing and whatnot so right. a pitch deck is so a pitch deck would be i think a good pitch deck covers three things it covers what product you're making um, and what's the value of that product it answers what market slash ecosystem you're playing in and then it also kind of ties together why the founder and their team started the project and like what makes them a good fit for uh the problem that they're solving so like how that relates to i think what we do is like you get hired by clients to do stuff but then when you build a relationship you can eventually pitch to them you can come to come to them with an idea and create some sort of deck the hardest True. thing though I, I always find is like you have ideas with creative um content and it's like, how do you get them to like buy into like your idea and like coming up with like, how does it make money is probably the hardest part. So like in your pitch deck, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, why is it worthwhile to invest in this video game? Like, what yeah. is it? So like, is it about the product or it's like, that's, this is what the market is and they'll all buy it. Like, what do you have to write in there? Well, I, that's a good question. That's a good question. I think that it's, it's not one thing. It's, it's a combination of all three, right? Like you have to, and it's kind of a, bigger idea of what's going on right now with whether you're starting a podcast or a side hustle in general, like you can have the best. I, I always think about, we have friends that are like fit fluencers or like who are starting mental health podcasts. We won't drop names. Um, but everyone thinks about the product first. I think it's, it's like partly a symptom of like just how we were raised and school. Like you just, you do an, an assignment or you work on a project. Um, so part of it's definitely that it's like, what value does your product bring to the market, what problem you are solving. Um, but the other two parts of that are like, who else? And it's such, I think it's, it's a big problem these days. Like who else is like trying to solve that problem? And like, what are the other players in the market doing? And I think that a lot of people these days get tied up in like category error. So everyone wants to make, I don't know, we can talk about, um, 
let's talk about this guy that we went to school with. We won't say his name, but he basically goes on Instagram and he gives people recipes and ways to like live healthier. So you could say that his product is like helping people live healthier, but like who else is competing in that market? You have him, you have other influencers, you might have health and wellness people, you could have um, people selling you workout routines, um, but you also have like video games, like video games help you recover, right? Like you could play a video game and spend three hours after you have a long shift, just like cooling down. So the second piece of the pitch is like, who else is in the market? Who's, who are you competing against? Um, and then like that third piece is like, why, what experience do you have? Or like, what do you know that other people don't that makes you the right fit for this product? Well, are you missing problem? like the differentiating factor? It's like why this is worthwhile to invest versus something else. You know what I mean? Like what yeah, about that goes this? back to product value? Right. But I wonder though in video game space, and you obviously can't mention everything, but like mm -hmm. w they're looking to invest in a game because the game's going to make money and put money in their pockets. Yep. But like, how do you prove it's going to put money in their pockets just by what they just understand what the product is through your explanation and then they value it? Because that's the hard part. How do you fucking mm -hmm. value the game? Like, do you have to know how much the game's going to cost per unit and then estimated sales? Or is it Those are some, what the game is? So the options would be like what the game is, how much are you going to make per purchase for the product? Um, and there's like other things too, like maybe you sell the game and then you have like microtransactions within the game. I think gaming itself is kind of an interesting space because we're moving from this model that me and you and kind of everyone else grew up in who's our age, where every year... Um, you'd have like these big publishers like Call of Duty or for our sports fans out there, like everyone knows that a new NHL game or a new FIFA game is coming out every year. So we had that product model. Um, but recently we've had titles like Fortnite and PUBG come out where the game publisher and the developer aren't going to charge you anything to purchase it right off the bat, um, but they're going to make all their money on transactions. Um, and so that's kind of like this bigger thing that's happening in video game. What was the original question? Because I kind of forgot it when I was answering it. I, I guess the original question was like, how do you like, what are the, what are the uh, yeah. investors? So how do you validate the, the demand for the product? Or like, why is the product going to succeed? Yeah, pretty much. Like, why even spend the money? Do they need to know dollar amounts they're going to get back? Or do they just have to buy into the technology behind the game? Okay. Good question. I'll answer it in two ways. So first, if I'm like the investor, the person that's giving the developer the money to make this game, I have to also understand, I think it's important to understand the context of how they make money. So they might have, we, we, in, in a year, they might have 10 founders or 10 game developers pitch them a concept. Um, and they'll give what? Like, just to simplify, they'll give anywhere from $1 million to $5 million to those founders, if we think it's an indie game. The chances of all 10 games going on being a commercial success is just so low, right? Like, if you're a really good investment firm, you're probably hitting maybe two out of 10 times. But the theory is that even if you get the other eight wrong, if I bet on Fortnite or if I bet on... You had a game that you're playing now that just came out. If I bet on one of those hot titles, they make up for all the losses that I've, that I've got. Uh, and right now, like, just in terms of the investment firms... Gaming is so hot right now. There's more gamers than ever. There's more people playing games. Games are making more money. So this space is really hot, and a lot of games are getting founded um, with with the kind of back end that a lot of these games aren't going to be successful, but if they just pick the one that is, they pay for all of their failures. Um, and then the second part of that quickly, just we can do this in 30 seconds, is that it's really hard to show the value of the product when you don't have a product out in the market. So what a lot of founders are doing right now is they're, um, the guy that I'm working with, he just had a clip of what he can do within the actual game engine. And he posted that out and I think it got like 30 or 40,000 um, impressions on Twitter. Like it just blew up like crazy and went viral. Um, and that's something that we'll talk about in the pitch deck. It's like there's interest there for something that looks like this and lets people do something like this. And then from there, like the step after that is that we captured a bunch of those people and we said like, hey, we're going to have a beta coming out in 12 months or whatever it was. Um, if you want early access and you want to be a part of this community, you can sign up to our Discord channel and this is where that is. And I think, I don't want to put a specific number on it, but it's somewhere in the thousands yeah. of people signed up for that. There's leverage we'll there. that as proof. It's yeah, like an exactly. audience, like leverage with audience. So that makes sense. Like there's clear interest. So you're selling interest. 
and whatnot. But I guess that's the tricky thing with early stage is it's there's no monetary understanding. There's only there's just, so much risk. It's just speculation and you're going to be taking yeah. a large risk. So yep. I wonder it's like how much money do you get when there is a risk? But for sure, I want to move into a different topic that's related. And you brought up there's different models of games. You got the Call of Duty's NHLs. You buy it every year or every couple of years, whatever the game is. And that's like where they make the money is through that game. And then there's games yep. like Fortnite, um, PUBG you have to pay for it to get. But Fortnite, Valorant, League of Legends, those are all games that you can get for free. And within there are mm. purchasable items. And this lines up with one of the things we want to talk about today, which is NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which are digital assets created. And it's not unlimited amount. There's a, there's a specific supply depending on what the NFT is. And it can range from a ton of, ton of things. Like in the in the uh, NBA, they have like specific clips of like an athlete doing it. I think with NHL Top Deck is what it's called. But then there's also artists who create art, <clears throat> excuse me, original art that they only make a certain amount of and then people buy it. So it increases this demand and you get this like QR code or some sort of code that identifies that it's unique and you can't get it anywhere else. And there's there's a they're selling for a lot of money. But this leads into the games where I play Valorant. And I play with a lot of guys when there's a new skin drop for guns, people go crazy. Like even Valorant, what they do is they publicize whenever they drop a new skin. And it's almost like clothing items and people go wild over these. There's always a discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you see the new skin pack? And what's interesting about this is there's different game companies that do sell skins. Riot, it's a free game to buy uh, Valorant and they own all the skins and they choose when you can drop it. There's no open marketplace. But if you play something like Counter-Strike, which it used to be free to play, now you buy it for like 15 bucks, but they have skins that they sell in the game or that you can unlock in uh, chests. And once you buy that skin or get it, you can then resell it on the open marketplace. And that price is dictated by whatever the people are buying it for. So it's like a free market idea. Um, and it opens up this world of like, these are actually investments you can make in your game or in yourself through a game. So if you unlock a new knife skin or you buy a skin online and you wait like three years, that skin could be worth because it's so old and like rare, it could be worth up to a thousand dollars if it's special. Mm -hmm. Right. Where it gets interesting though is Counter-Strike doesn't own the skins. I right? once the player owns it, they own it and they can put it in a marketplace. But with Valorant, you get a skin, you can't sell it, you can't trade it. But if you decide to sell your account, with all those skins on it, you can charge people a premium for that account, depending on what your right. rank is. So and this the is kind of how you make money. This is how you make money if the skin's like uh, locked into the game and you can't sell it kind of openly. Exactly. Or there's Fortnite skins that you can only get for a period of time that show that this account's really old or it's like a really rare skin. And where NFTs get interesting in that way is I wonder if there's a way eventually to get these skins off the game, but onto like some sort of like wallet, like a crypto wallet type th type, type mm -hmm. deal or on your hard drive where you have these tokens that show that you like own a part of this game's history and a history of time. And I wonder if it's, a, if it's ever going to turn into an asset over time that it makes sense to buy these things in game and like own for the future of like your financial endeavors. Yeah, I know. It, it's, it's a crazy question. I think what stops so many people and I hear this from like I was trying to explain this to my mom the other day I was like there's this like there's there's these things called nfts which are basically like just digital items that people are paying a lot of money for right now and she's looking at me and she's kind of like like with most people her age she's thinking like okay so we'll use we'll use basketball exam for as an example because those highlights are going crazy if I spend I think I saw somebody paid a million dollars for a lamella ball highlight the other day and I saw that on Twitter and I was just like, what? Like, how How do you justify paying that much money? Like, if I'm just browsing online, as we do, and I'm on YouTube and I want to see a LaMelo Ball highlight, like, do I have to pay that person now? Like, how does that work? And I was kind of having this conversation with my mom and I was like, so if I buy, it, she asked a really good question. She says, like, if you made a piece of art, a piece of digital art, and you sold it on this blockchain and somebody bought it, What's stopping another person from just going wherever the piece of art is shared and then screenshotting it? Like, does that not erode the value? And I didn't have a great answer because I hear that all the time. It's like, if it's on the web, right, like anyone can access it, like what's the point of owning it? 
Um, well, and I didn't have a great answer. Like I, I still don't really understand from um, my that understanding, piece of it. But the thing is, you get it, like I said earlier, you get like a QR code or there's some sort of code that builds into the blockchain that is an authenticator. So it's yeah. impossible for it to be, there's no, you can't like replicate it and resell it because it gets all checked through the blockchain. Like it's self, um, okay. self auditing. Cause okay. what gets so interesting. Are, are you saying, go ahead. Are you saying that it's the ownership piece of it? It's like anyone can see it, but it's just like having a fake, pay- I got rid, this is a funny story. So this would be 2016. Uh, Ye- the Yeezys had just come out, the 350s, and everyone was talking about them. But nobody cared in Thunder Bay. Like in Thunder Bay, people knew about them, but like they're not really fashion. I-, I have this joke, this inside joke with my sister that like if something is hot in Toronto, like a piece of clothing is hot in Toronto, it'll be hot in Thunder Bay in the next three years because yeah. there's the like weird lag. <laughs> but anyways, I I see these Yeezys are exploding everywhere in 2016, um, and so. I'm like, okay, how do I get a pair of these? And I look online, it's like 500 bucks or something crazy. I'm like, there's no way I'm spending that much money on shoes. So I look on uh, Alibaba, AliExpress, and I wait a month and a half or something. And I get these fake pair of Yeezys. And it's great in Thunder Bay because everyone's like, oh, you have Yeezys. I'm like, no, 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 they're fake. But like, it looks like I have them. They're like, oh, that's so cool. Anyways, fast forward, I, I come to Toronto, come to university, and I like wear them the first week of school, or maybe somebody came to my apartment and saw them. And like, you could obviously tell they were fakes. Like, they weren't even good fakes. And I just remember getting ripped over this. They're so, like, why would you spend your money on a fake product? And so, where this is coming back to the NFTs is that, like, I guess it's kind of the same thing. Like, you're buying ownership. It's not that anyone else can't see or view the thing, it's just that, like, the the real thing is is so much more valuable than like a copy of it. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of my information I'm getting from is from Clubhouse because I'm on there and I, I go into these rooms where like these like huge tech investors and billionaires and shit, they all talk about NFTs. And I learned a lot through these Clubhouse rooms. Obviously, I don't know if any of this is real. It could all be fucking <laughs> fake news. It's just Clubhouse. But what's interesting is so that... NFT is in the blockchain and there's an authenticator when you sell it, you it, it double checks if it's real or not. Mm-hmm. And where it gets interesting is once whoever creates it has like ownership of it and they sell it to someone. Okay. Yep. Someone buys it. Usually for more money, just quickly, usually for more money, the way these things are working right now. What do you mean more money? Like if I, if, if the person that bought the Lamella ball highlight for a million dollars and I'm like, that is so crazy. Like that person could very well go a month later and then put it online and somebody could buy it for 3 million. Like that's what I'm really seeing. These things are just skyrocketing in price. Well, that's where it's interesting After because you it. when you buy it, it's authenticated through the blockchain. You own the code to it and they're developing ways according to this clubhouse room I was in where the ownership can attach royalties to that code code in the blockchain so when you put something online and it's through a contract so not every contract has royalties attached but what you can do is have part ownership of that clip or that thing whatever the nft is forever where if you sell it to someone you make that money and if they decide to resell in the future you can get a percent and then when it it sells again you get a percent when it sells again you get a percent until the end of time depending on the contract that's written into the blockchain which is so fucking interesting. And you got to think about all the companies that have IP that people would buy in NFT form. That's where it gets yeah. really interesting long term. Yeah. And uh, it's all authenticated. So it's almost impossible to get a fake unless someone's obviously hacking into the blockchain. I don't understand any of that stuff, but I think it's like, super, I don't either. It's super interesting. Um, what was I going to say? I completely forget, but NFTs are interesting, man. And I, I wonder where. I think where it's most interesting for me is in video games, just watching the craze and what happens to people when they see these new skins come out. Like it is like buying mm-hmm. shoes, buying clothes. Cause when you're in game and you have that new skin, people go, yo bro, I, like, can you like drop me one of those? Like, well, and like play the round with it. Like it's, it's get, it gets weird. Like people yeah. they feel better. It's like clothing. They feel better when playing, when they have this stuff. And what's interesting about Valorant is that there's a shop where for a week straight or two weeks, they sell a certain amount of skins in a pack. It's called like a skin pack mm-hmm. and they all have a theme. And then underneath every, I think it's like eight hours or 24 hours, they have like four different skins from random packs that like they like shuffle every 40, every 24 hours. So then there's always this like supply or there's this supply and demand um, aspect to it. And I wonder if Valorant 
would ever open a marketplace where you can trade skins and then they make money off of that as a new revenue source. Mm -hmm. That's where yeah. shit gets cool. Super interesting. Um, and I also think just like early stage too, because I think with a lot of things these days, like we always talk about how it's easier than ever for somebody to just participate in the game, whether that game is making content or launching a company or launching a business, like it's easier than ever to start. But as a consequence, I think it's been harder than ever or more difficult to get traction. Um, and so one of the things that I'm kind of most interested with this NFT space is like, how does it improve the alignment between somebody who really supports the mission of a business? We had, we had a fitness guy on earlier today. We talked about it at the start um, with the audio that, that went crazy or whatever. But um, let's just back up a bit and say like he has this mission where he he loves he's passionate about athlete recovery and he has this um, he has these devices I guess that help um, the body recover and maybe I'm an athlete or I'm just somebody early on in the company and I'm like and I see this company as an outsider I'm like I really want some way to invest in this business because I really believe in the mission but like I don't have the capital maybe I'm a 20 to 30 year old kid or just kind of getting into the workforce and I don't have the capital to um, support them financially. Like I could shout them out to my friends and kind of give them a referral. But I think what's most interesting is like if I could buy an NFT or some piece of ownership in the company, and then as that company kind of appreciates in value or they get more traction, the business kind of grows bigger, how my kind of um, bit of faith or support of that company early could get me some kind of royalty and I can sell this digital asset or whatever it is. I really think that it brings the customer, um, kind of this, this super fan customer closer in alignment and gives them more ways and opportunities to support the missions and the companies they believe in. I mean, that, that I think that's what they were talking about on, or I, mean, I think it was Logan Paul was talking about that too. I, I forget exactly, but there, there, there's so many opportunities, not just for, um, like big brands. It's also just if you have a serious fan base as like a YouTube creator or whatever, like you can create these NFTs for fans that, you know, can help you. It gives them something because they're a super fan that they can like hold on to and really cherish while also supporting you. It's so, it's so fucking cool. I think the creator example is like probably even more, um, it, it applies equally as well, if not better, where like, I know that Mr. Beast has tweeted a couple times, like this huge, probably the biggest YouTuber on the platform. He's like, I wish there was a way for me to invest in a creator who I think is going to be successful earlier in their career. And so he can do that with cash. Um, but if you're not in that Mr. Beast level of fame and popularity where you can move the needle that way, um, for creators that you really mess with and you like, I, I love the vision or whatever, exactly. It's going to be like, you can buy and show support and buy into their mission in some meaningful way and then be rewarded for being early to that. I had I had another I want to switch switch pace here uh, quickly. You you had mentioned that there's this craze around skins and stuff and reselling and how there's like we we really shifted in kind of a drop culture with with products being released. Um, which reminded me of the story that I saw earlier this week. Um, so the headline reads uh, Nike vice president of North America resigns after um, family tie to sneaker reseller uncovered. So if you're any like I'm not a huge sneaker guy, I just kind of like the culture and, and this crazy fandom around it. Um, but if you're on Twitter and you hear about sneakers, all you care about is that like, oh, I took a loss on, on the sneakers app today. So Nike has this app. Um, and you could basically, I don't know, like you, you put yourself, you put a vote in or you, you virtually stand in line um, when a new sneaker drops and you're like, if they pick me, then I get this sneaker and then I can resell it for whatever. So sneaker reselling has been this, this huge thing. And basically, uh, Nike had to fire one of their vice presidents who I, I have to add worked for the company for 25 years. I could not imagine working for a job for 25 years. You Here's why zoomer. she had to quit. Here's, here's exactly yeah millennial uh, here's why she had to quit um i'm gonna read it so i don't butcher it uh her name's ann herbert ann herbert is leaving nike um days after bloomberg ran a piece focused on her son a 19 year old sneaker reseller named joe um and the piece mentioned that <laughs> joe was using his mom's credit card vp of nike or whatever she was um to start his sneaker reselling business west coast streetwear uh, and if you scroll down, we'll, we'll link some image, images or maybe we'll, we'll find a way to show you this. But basically, like this kid is flexing, like he's got at least 100 boxes 
of new like Nike off white sneakers that are just like impossible for anyone to find. <laughs> if this is my question, this is where all of this is leading. I know this has gone on a bit. If you're the mom who's worked for this place for 25 years and you have to quit, you have to quit your job. You get fired effectively. Um, quits just like a glorified way of saying she keeps her pension and she gets all the benefits because your son is reselling sneakers and making millions that way. Like, what's your react? What are you saying to the kid? I mean, like, how can you blame a kid for just being a hustler? I, I mean, I can see the conflict of interest. That's a little sketch. I mean, it's a little sketch, some- especially with how big sneakers have got. Like this kid's not this is not just like some small business. This kid's making a lot of money. But I feel like it's a it's definitely a conflict of interest stuff, because like what if he's getting knowledge before drops are happening or whatnot? You know oh, what I mean? Definitely is. Definitely is. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a little sketch. I, I It definitely makes sense. What do you say to the kid? I wouldn't be surprised if she was in on it. Or had an idea, yeah. but turned a blind eye. And that's where yeah. it gets sketch. Like, that's okay, that's where and, it's and bad. Exactly. And here's my follow-up. If you're the kid, what are you doing talking to Bloomberg? If this is on the low-low and you're making a lot of money, like, are you trying to flex? Are you trying to get some clout? Like, what are you doing talking about your business to this fucking, this media company? Whatever gets the IG followers. <laughs> I don't followers. understand so much about the, the IG followers. <laughs> Just the IG I got to search up. I got to search up how many followers West, what is it? West Coast Streetwear. First one, <laughs> West Coast Streetwear. <laughs> the name's just Joe. And he's got entrepreneur in the bio. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, I'm, I'm looking at probably, so this is, this is not going to be perfect, but this is just some rough math. I'm looking at a new pair of Yeezy Boosts. I'm going to say ballpark they resell for 250 to 300 bucks. Maybe higher, maybe lower. Don't shoot me. Um, and he has, let's see how long the stack is, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. He's got a column of 12 boxes, and he's probably got 25 rows of those. Let's go 25 by 12, oh, no. quick math, 300, 300, we'll say conservatively 350. This is just in the one picture. So this kid... On just this one picture, this one supply drop of Yeezys would have made 105 k <laughs> He's making RuneScape oh money flipping God. stuff on the Grand Exchange. Holy shit. Oh. Yeah. And I don't they think, messed it all up. They I don't think she can up. keep her Is job it? after that. That's no, that's a bit No, It's no troublesome. small amount of money. Yeah. That's that's some big boy bucks. It's interesting. Okay, so my, my, final, my final question here is like, why, if I'm a kid in high school... Would I sell drugs when I can make 105k selling sneakers these days? Like, are, are sneakers, is that the new flex in I mean, high school? I don't know if drugs is the other option. I don't know why that's where your mind went. Well, like, the, the high school entrepreneurs, and he's not selling, he's not selling pastries. <laughs> no, soon they're going to be selling NFTs. They just have, like, a bunch of USB sticks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's interesting. It's it's definitely it's crazy how people are going to be able to make money when, uh, like, I mean, even today. It's There's so many just ways was not available to us. There's so many different ways, and it it, it, it almost like it, it almost shows there's no excuse to be like complaining about your job. But at the same time, I guess I just wonder why more people aren't doing it. I guess it's just we have a we don't have like a big enough culture of self starters or something like I don't I don't know what it is maybe it has to go to education I think we were talking about that the other day where it's like how many kids are you know being raised and like socialized in a way to look at themselves as not just like you get good grades you get a job but more be very curious get creative and look for new ways to make money you know look for ways to like fulfill a need whatever that is. I just wonder what it is that, we're, that it holds people back. Maybe just people are different. Not everyone's a self-starter. Is it conditioned Absolutely. or is it is it biological? And so it's the way their uh, genetic makeup is. I, I just don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Me, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was actually talking about my mom. My mom's a teacher, a university professor, um, and I was I brought it up to her uh, last night, and I was like, "Oh, me and Will were talking about how it, even in our university grade, like our graduating class, we it's it's it was so easy to see the people that." thought that they were playing the game really well and the game they were playing was let me get the 95 or 85 or whatever the mark was like a great mark on this assignment um let me 
badger the teacher if I don't get that mark. Let me make sure that I read the rubric 10 times and understand how to do this assignment. And if I have any questions, like they're the first people that are going to email the professor and then email them twice more if they don't get a reply. Um, and so like as a consequence, like they think that they're playing the game really well. And this isn't a value judgment. Like if that's your shtick, that's your shtick, whatever. Um, but what we're seeing is that like I've noticed this in a bunch of friends. I definitely saw this with uh, the graduating classes that kind of came before us at Ryerson where you get that piece of paper at the end of your university, your four year university degree. And it's like, okay, well, what's next now? Like, there's no checklist. There's no like assignment rubric. Like no one's going to tell you what to do. Um, and, and kind of to the point of being a self-starter or not being a self-starter, it's like, we, I don't think as an economy right now, and this is kind of painting in broad strokes, but like people aren't being rewarded like they used to for being able to follow a checklist or do something well. And we're seeing that a lot of those jobs are being automated. And I think that like our education system, whether it's university or high school, um, conditions people for the first, like I, what I was like, what 20, when I graduated, I was 22. So the first 22 years of my life was spent following it. Like my reward was like following the checklist. Your reward and was a result that, not exactly, necessarily yeah. for what you gained out of it. And that's the thing yeah. we we're talking about in school is like how many people are doing an assignment looking to get knowledge and acquire things besides a grade from that assignment. Because that's that number is so few. Your grade is Fair actually in insignificant unless obviously you, you're going to get your master's and you want to go post, you know, you want to go post grad education. Mm -hmm. The grade's insignificant to a certain degree. It's like, are, did you gain a lot out of it? Because I know, I mean, I think I've seen people and I believe that they complete something to complete it, not to actually grow from it. Mm -hmm. And like, why are you taking, what's the goal of university in the first place? I guess that's different well, for so every young. person, but like, we're the goal so is to learn something. It's not like a pass fail or like a specific number that you have to hit. But it's tough. But I, I, I do think that a lot of people miss that or that they they're playing the wrong game. I agree. And it, it just, it seeps into the way you function in the world. It's just like, Oh, my shift is done now. I'm in the clear instead of being like, mm -hmm. I got everything done. I'm in the clear. You know what I mean? That I set out to do exactly. today, which I think is the way to think. And it's like what everyone says, the cliche, it's about the process, like trust the process, focus on the process, not on the result. It's like, but we are not taught that. Like we're not, not maybe not taught that, but we're not socialized in school to think that way. And those are our formative. I don't know if anyone years. explicitly said that to us or at least to me. Yeah. Last thread I wanted to open up was um, this idea of, so for, we started this conversation talking about this video game founder who wants to release this product to the market. And in investment world, people talk about this like product market fit. So is there a fit between the product you're offering and the market that you're trying to serve. Um, and so it's it's like this huge concept within Silicon Valley and kind of the um, startup world. Um, but I see this kind of, I want to talk about this in the context of creators. I think there is a, um, there is a writer topic fit or a um, creator market fit. And the reason that I brought this up was that we had this fitness guy on or a fitness founder on earlier today. And I think that like even just talking to him for an hour, it was really clear that the product that he kind of brought to market was really authentic to um, challenges that he was facing in his life and a problem that he didn't see being solved. How does this apply to, if you had to give somebody advice who was like, I want to start a podcast or I want to start a company what advice would you give to that person to make sure that whatever they're creating is authentic to them? Uh, I, I feel like I can't even answer that because I feel like I'm not, I don't even know. Like, it's almost like you just got to do what feels natural and just be fearless about that. And that's authentic to them. You know what I mean? Like, I just don't know if there's anything I could say. I wish I could say something more, more to that. Um, Man, I, you also put me on the spot. That's my job. Okay, okay. Well, you exactly. Well, you think about that. Like, how? So we started this podcast for creative people. How have you backed into this podcast from an authentic place? Like, in terms of the content that we cover, in terms of the problems that we're trying to solve, what experience 
what experiences did you have? Um, when did you start? You probably started this just me being a guest. 2017. You've had three years and change since then. What problems in those three years um, are what experiences or problems or challenges in those three years did you face that have informed what we're talking about and like the problems that you're trying to solve with the podcast? Well, okay. Well, answering the first question, it's I just feel like I had all these conversations with ton of a ton of other creators and I learned so much from them and pick up so many tips that I thought if we do a podcast interviewing these people, it's going to be way more interesting. And also doing a podcast with you, which we've talked so much about things that I think would be interesting to have. In and it just gets lost it gets after lost. like the conversation ends. It's like, okay, lights off. Then we're going to go do whatever. And, and the struggle is to for us to like not feel like this is a podcast and just to chat. And I think when we did that one in-person podcast, it was literally a chat. Whereas so on good. Zoom, it, it doesn't necessarily feel like a chat as much because there's like this weird feeling like I got to like present and be a show. But I think just like all the conversations I've had, I'm like, I've learned so much. The person I'm talking to has learned so much. And it's just an interesting, like good time. So like, I, I'm like, how do I get that into a podcast is pretty much the thing. Mm-hmm. How do I take those conversations I've had off air and bring them on air. And that's what excites me. And also inviting new guests on to learn from them is what excites me in building this community, which it's, it's slowly. I'm always surprised at how much a guest brings. Oh, it's every, everyone inevitably has something that I haven't thought of. And I'm like, Oh, that was like, we had uh, Jacob on the other week and he was talking about how you should split up the step of finding music for your videos and like actually making the videos. And I was like, geez, if I would have thought of that when I started out, like it would just been so much easier to find good tracks. You spend hours looking for the right track for your video. But if you just did that as a separate step, like you just have all those tracks loaded. And they're all there. And it's just small stuff like that. A hundred percent. And you just get, and also like, well, we always reference that Sarah Jenkins episode we left that episode just energized. Like we were so mm-hmm. excited about like potential and what could happen. So I feel like you just got at, with the, with creating a new endeavor like that. You just got to, you got to think this is what Dom said uh, earlier this morning with the podcast. We, I fucked up was he's like, I wasn't just doing this business to make money. It was also because I felt good, like helping these people who are, who were and are in my shoes. You know, that's mm-hmm. what gave me the meaning, not the money I get from selling my first device or whatever. It's, it's, it's what you get out of it in somewhat of a self with selfless way. I guess what we're doing is kind of selfish because we're learning it, but also, we're also, we're also sharing it. We're also like letting other people hear these like incredible people talk. So mm-hmm. I feel like you just, you just got to do what you're interested in, learn from it yourself and then share with people so they can learn from it also, you know? I love that. I love that. I just want to bring up one last thing about this kind of authenticity and just making sure there's a fit there. Um, you, We were talking the other day off camera, off microphone, and you were talking about like you're bringing on some interns with this company that you're working for. Um, and you're saying that like these kids could learn, like if the only thing that you taught these kids were that how to set up their Premiere Pro projects um, and their user interface to make the most sense and like what's the process for like making a video and what steps you go to, like you will have offered them so much more value than they could ever get from a salary. And I think about the podcast and kind of the knowledge that we share in a very similar way. Like if we can save people time, if we can kind of bring the frustration out of like this very, cause I think in a lot of ways, I think design is more guilty of this than video specifically, but I think that people guard information in the industry so secretively about how they work if we can just bring like 1% more transparency to making a more effective and efficient creative process for you, I just think about all the hours that I would have saved if somebody had just showed me like, oh, when you design, like you should have all of your assets like figured out before you actually jump in so you don't waste time searching for things. Like that would have just saved me so much time. Um, And this is kind of a cheap way of like figuring out what the mission for like what we're doing is and, and talking about it on air. But that's kind of really the mission that I see um, and like how you achieve that, that authenticity, I think really is from kind of backing in from a place of, oh, I've had these, pa- I've had these problems and challenges in the past. And if somebody else was in my shoes two or three years ago, this is the advice or like, this is the information that I want them to have. So they don't have to struggle or deal with the same frustration that I did. But the weird thing is some people don't listen or acknowledge the advice until exactly they've ignored it and fell into that problem and then they learned from hitting rock bottom or hitting that moment of like, fuck, 
you know? I will never forget to save this file again, or I will never yeah. forget to, like... I think, oh, uh, what was the organize. example I had? Yeah, organize organize your files so that, like, if you change something in your file structure... This is so nerdy, Premiere Pro stuff, but if, like, you change something in your file structure, um, it doesn't, like, mess up your whole project file, and, like, then you have to spend another 30 minutes, like, figuring that out. Exactly. It's small stuff like that that can help, but I am definitely one of those people. Like, take this advice because from somebody who learned these lessons the hard way, like, don't be the person that has to learn by making mistakes as much as you can. Um, because you'll just save yourself so much time and frustration. Exactly. Boom. There it is. Mic drop. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you guys next week. Make sure to follow us at Run and Repeat Podcast. You know the whole deal, all the platforms, including YouTube, where you can watch this video on our beautiful faces. We'll see you guys next week. Ciao, bello. Peace.